4.30 p.m. Good evening, I'm Oteli Edwards. On News 5 tonight, an ongoing standoff between French police and the alleged Jewish school gunman. The Al-Qaeda-linked suspect says his attack was revenge for Palestinian kids. An action plan to clamp down on human trafficking will include more victim support, such as granting immunity for certain offences. It's a victim of trafficking. They're someone's sister, someone's daughter. COE prices break the $80,000 mark for the first time in 18 years. And a plan to hand free iPads to every Thai MP has sparked outrage. We begin with a developing story in France. Now, French media say police have arrested a gunman they believe to be responsible for the killing of four people at a Jewish school in Toulouse. The suspect earlier told negotiators that he will surrender. The French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, has arrived near the scene of the siege. And you are looking at latest pictures from the raid, which has dragged on for half a day. Police have named the suspect as Mohamed Mera, a French national who claims Al-Qaeda connections. Afghan prison officials said he had been sentenced to three years in a Kandahar jail before escaping. Gunfire and an explosion were heard as police sealed off the area. The gunman has wounded two police officers and flung out a pistol. Police are also investigating a phone call made to a local news station a couple of hours before the raid. A man claimed to be the school shooter vowed that he would soon upload videos of the attack on the internet. Police converged on an apartment in Toulouse in the early hours, cornering the man suspected of killing three children and a rabbi at a Jewish school in the city. Police believe the suspect is the same person who killed three soldiers of North African origin in two shootings last week. They say the same handgun was used in all three attacks. Police say the 24-year-old suspect has spoken to officers through the door of the apartment. Depuis, l'individu parle beaucoup. Il se revendique d'être un mujahidin, d'appartenir à Al-Qaïda et d'avoir voulu venger des enfants palestiniens en même temps que d'avoir voulu s'en prendre à l'armée française compte tenu de ses interventions à l'extérieur. Police also say the man is a French national who was previously arrested in Afghanistan. Authorities say they have also detained the suspect's brother for questioning. The attacks raised France's alert status to its highest level in three decades. In Jerusalem, the bodies of the four victims in Monday's attack on the Jewish school have arrived in Tel Aviv for burial. Over 2,000 people came to mourn their deaths. France's foreign minister, Alan Juppé, was among the mourners. Mr. Juppé and Israeli President Shimon Peres say the attack has bound France and Israel together. In a separate incident, a homemade parcel bomb has rocked the Indonesian embassy in Paris. It went off shortly before dawn, blowing out windows within a 50-meter radius and setting fire to two cars. The police chief says a worker clearing bins in the street had spotted a bag under the embassy's windows. He opened it and dropped it after he saw a canister attached to wires inside. Police say it contained several kilograms of explosives. No one has claimed responsibility for the attack. And a police source describes it as a small miracle that there are no victims. Elsewhere, a Lebanese man with suspected links to Hezbollah has pleaded not guilty to charges of breaking Thailand's weapons control laws. Actress Hussein was arrested in Bangkok in January. Police discovered at a rented address a large amount of chemicals that could be used to make a bomb. Hussein was said to be storing the explosive materials there before shipping them to another destination. He faces up to five years in jail. A powerful 7.4 magnitude earthquake has struck southwest Mexico, injuring 11 people. The border areas of southern Oaxaca and Guerrero states felt the tremors the most. Guerrero officials confirmed that about 800 homes had been damaged. In Mexico City, frightened workers and residents fled buildings for safety. A pedestrian bridge also collapsed and fell on a passenger bus in the capital. Fortunately, there was no one on board except the driver who escaped with minor nose injuries. 
In the U.S., Mitt Romney has expanded his lead over Rick Santorum in their bid for the Republican presidential nomination. He won comfortably with 47% of the vote in President Barack Obama's home state of Illinois. Santorum notched up 35%. Ron Paul had 9%. And Newt Gingrich trailed with 8%. The latest result gives fresh momentum to Mr. Romney's campaign as the race moves to northeast and mid-Atlantic states that are friendly terrain for him. Singapore has launched a national plan of action against trafficking in persons aimed at taking a more holistic fight against human trafficking. This comes after a three-month-long consultation with various stakeholders. While human trafficking is not a severe problem in Singapore, authorities here do agree that because of the country's high people flows, it's an attractive platform for traffickers. A lot of the time, the problem is with sex and labour trafficking. What does this national plan of action really mean for all of us? Well, I think for one, it signals that the Singapore government is committed towards fighting trafficking in persons, more holistically, more strategically, and I think more effectively. One of the first tasks is to train some 10,000 frontline officers so they can identify victims, know what to do and how to help them. Standard operating procedures will be altered in the way cases are referred and investigations carried out. This means victims of trafficking should get immunity from other offences, for example, being charged with overstaying or prostitution. So that the people who are trafficked get the message very, very clearly that they're not uh, being treated mainly as violators of Singapore law, but as people who deserve support and help. There will be specialised enforcement teams to combat sex and labour trafficking by end 2013. Current rules are also being reviewed to see if Singapore needs a dedicated human trafficking law, which NGOs argue will plug current gaps in prosecution. Authorities will also adopt a more victim-centric approach and enhance care services. This victim of trafficking, they are a person, a human, they are someone's sister, someone's daughter, someone's mother. They are supporting somebody back home. They have a family to support. So every month of delay is a month too long for them. NGO said education is key. So that we are no longer blind to what may be the reality or what ends up on our tables, in our shops, uh, as consumers. The government has heard strong call to speed up certain initiatives like the accession to the United Nations TIP protocol, but it's not yet ready to do so. It says there's a need to conduct a thorough review and ensure that Singapore is able to fulfil its obligations in an international agreement first. Authorities said the plan is not a static one and is prepared to take in new ideas. New York has been awarded the Lee Kuan Yew World City Prize this year. The prestigious biennial award recognizes city administrat administrators rather, for outstanding contributions towards creating vibrant, livable and sustainable urban communities. New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg is in town to receive the honor. He says the Big Apple has changed much in the past decade. For instance, it has added with more than 400 kilometers of bicycle lanes and has closed off sections for pedestrians in places like the iconic Times Square. New parkland and public spaces have also been reclaimed. The pace of change is going to continue to grow and we're going to have to learn how to live with that and it's going to provide great challenges to governments and to peoples, uh, whether you're in Singapore or in New York uh, or every other city. The difference is successful cities will find a ways to cope and unsuccessful cities will just throw up their hands and let them come apart. Well, New York beat out 60 other contenders for the prize. And separately, Mr. Bloomberg met Prime Minister Lee Hsien Lung and other cabinet ministers at the Astana this evening. COE premiums for big cars have hit $82,000. The last time premiums for big cars breached the $80,000 mark was in December 1994, when it climbed to $110,500. The open category, mostly used for big cars, saw the biggest increase of over $3,000 to close around $80,100. Dealers say demand could have been fueled by luxury brands bringing in new models. Premiums for commercial vehicles saw an increase of about $1,500 to end at $51,500. The only drop was in the small cars category, where premiums dropped just $50 to close at about $56,500. Dealers were expecting a bigger drop in the small cars category, as retail demand had not picked up in recent weeks. In this round, we got taxi company coming in in very big ways. They end up 
of the 1,000 over bids submitted, they constitute almost 30% of the bids being put in. And that sort of keep the prices from, from falling. So in a way, the, the current premium is not really reflective of the market demand at the moment. Coming up on News 5, we go undercover to track errant drivers. Hey, give me a fine, anything, yeah, I don't I mind. Understand. No child born after the 1st of January, the year 2000, would ever be able to buy cigarettes. And radical ideas to make Singapore smoke-free. News 5 tonight. Traffic police caught some 900 offenders flouting road rules in their covert operations between last October and the end of last month. It comes with more regular deployment of plain clothes officers and unmarked vehicles. We are going to seize your handphone. We can only return you back your SIM card. You can give me a fine, anything. Uh, yeah, I don't I mind. This is my business phone. Yes, I understand. Earn money, you know? Yes, I understand. Okay, but this is the... I can give you another <laughs> We can't do that. We will only bring back the handphone that oh, you use. A reporter was on one such covert operation where traffic police caught a driver using his mobile phone while driving. They had been following him from Sims Drive to the Tuapayo exit along the Penn Island Expressway. Those caught using a mobile phone while driving can be fined up to $1,000 and be jailed for six months. It's one of the top five offences motorists get caught for by these covert operations. And the top offence? Beating the red light. You've been warned. Plain clothes officers hiding in a crowd have, been, have made it harder for offenders to escape the law. Other top offences include careless driving, making unauthorised U-turns and not wearing a seatbelt. A new memo on wheels bus is hitting the road soon. Minister of State for Health Dr. Amy Kaur launched the bus upgraded to serve a growing population. On top of mammogram services, it now has screening facilities for hearing problems and for detecting eyesight issues for people with diabetes. It will travel to community events and private organizations. Bukit Bato East has become the first residential estate here to adopt a voluntary smoking ban in the common areas of one precinct. It's part of a health promotion board campaign to work with communities on tobacco control. At about 15%, Singapore's smoking rate is one of the lowest in the world. But experts say bringing smoking down further will be slower and harder from here on. With tough top-down policies already in place, the Health Promotion Board is now looking at ground-up solutions. We are also helping the communities to mark out places which they feel that it should be smoke-free so that voluntarily they maintain the place as smoke-free for the benefit of the community. And the board wants to roll out voluntary smoke-free zones island-wide by 2015. Experts from around the world are in Singapore for a world conference on tobacco control. And some say Singapore could go further and try out more daring options. One of the ideas is that no child born after the 1st of January, the year 2000, would ever be able to buy cigarettes in Singapore. I don't just mean until they're 18, but never. So that there would be a whole smoke-free generation. In other words, it would phase out smoking. Now, this hasn't been tried anywhere in the world. A new tobacco atlas says almost 6 million people died from tobacco use in 2010 alone. Nearly 80% of these deaths occurred in low- and middle-income countries. And if trends continue, the atlas estimates that 1 billion people will die from tobacco use or exposure during the 21st century. That's one death every six seconds. Now, you might have heard of the Thai government's promise to give all first graders new tablet PCs. And now its latest plan to give free iPads to MPs is getting plenty of swipes from members of the public. A job perk that has tapped into a bit of outrage. Government-sponsored, fully loaded iPads for all 650 MPs and senators in Thailand. These iPads are in addition to their salaries, free unlimited domestic air travel, a laptop computer and five assistants. And there may be iPhones for free in the future. The reaction to the plan on Facebook was swift, with comments like, they'll use it to play Angry Birds while waiting for a meeting. 
and it's clear they have the money but want one for free. The plan will cost the Yingluck administration 1.6 million U.S. dollars, and the recipients are some of the wealthiest people in the kingdom. Thailand's 150 sitting senators declared a total of 677 million U.S. dollars in assets before taking office. Proponents say it will reduce paper use and allow officials to access agendas, bills and laws. But some Thais, who've had to buy iPads from their own pockets, think it's too much. <laughs> Senator Rosanna Tositra Kun wants people to write in to tell lawmakers to spend this money elsewhere. She already has an iPad and says she doesn't need another. I don't think that it is so necessary. It's just a luxury thing for the for our and uh, we we should think about the people that uh, you see that all the fluor or everything is uh, high, have a high price. The senator knows that refusing the freebie though won't save the government any money as it's almost a done deal. Anastasia Saniel, Channel News Asia, Bangkok. Next, something to train your eyes on, a wedding dress that takes the cake. You're looking at part of the world's longest bridal train in Romania. At nearly three kilometers long, it's no wonder a hot air balloon was needed to show off the creation. Ten seamstresses went to great lengths and took 100 days to create the silk and lace gown. It was made to measure for this year's wedding festival in Bucharest. And still to come on five, a mesmerizing Messi smashes a record for Barcelona. <laughs> And hopes for a move that could raise this sports profile ahead of the national cheerleading championships. In business news, a new 500-room hotel with six floors of retail space as well as office space will open in Orchard Road in the second half of 2013. Called Orchard Gateway, the development will straddle the sites formerly occupied by Hotel Phoenix Specialist Centre and Orchard Emerald. The two towers will be linked by a glass, tubular overhead bridge as well as an underpass across Orchard Road. The owners of Formula One Motor Racing are considering a partial flotation of the business in Singapore. F1 chief Bernie Ecclestone said today he had recommended the city-state as a location for the flotation of its business. However, he added that the decision will be up to F1's major majority owners, CVC Capital Partners. When contacted by Channel News Asia, CVC said the reports are purely market speculation. And here are the market numbers. It's been a long time coming, but the Muppets finally have a star on the Walk of Fame. We are just really happy to be here on Hollywood Boulevard today, uh, joining some of the greatest names in showbiz, right guys? Yeah! Kermit, Miss Piggy and gang accepted the honor with the son and daughter of Muppets creator Jim Hansen on hand. Their star is parked near that of Hansen's and Kermit's. It has been half a century since Kermit first made his debut on TV, and he and his Muppets family have been going strong ever since, winning a new generation of fans with their latest movie. Hola. <laughs> okay, come on, rehearsing. Let's go. We gotta break it up. Excuse us. Excuse us. Is Lionel Messi the Michael Jordan of football? Well, his coach Pep Guardiola certainly thinks so, especially after he shattered Barcelona's all-time goal-scoring record with a hat-trick in their win over Granada at the new camp. But Messi doesn't just score goals. He set up teammate Xavi for the opener. He then tied Cesar Rodriguez's 232-goal record with this pinpoint volley. 
Granada scored two in the second half to level the match, only for Messi to break the 60-year record with this sumptuous lob. Barca's Tello then made it 4-2, and Messi capped his hat-trick with some magnetic control. Granada scored a penalty to make it 5-3, but not enough to stop Barca from moving within five points of Spanish league leaders Real Madrid. Blackburn Rovers have kept their hopes alive for survival in the English Premier League with a crucial 2-0 win over Sunderland. David Hoylet opened the scoring early in the first half of at Ewood Park and Ayagabani Yakubu sealed the deal in the closing minutes. Blackburn are now six points clear of the bottom three. Singapore's women paddlers turned out tops at the World Table Tennis Championships two years ago in Moscow. But this year, table tennis chief Lee B. Wai admits it's near impossible for them to defend their trophy. The paddlers had a bit of fun before heading off to the World Championships in Dortmund, Germany. The team hosted 15 autistic kids from the Grace Orchard School at Universal Studio Singapore, aged between 11 and 13 years. The kids, along with the players, took the rides at the theme park. Singapore Table Tennis Association hopes such an outing would help the paddlers relax before the major competition. Immediately after the Asia Championship in Macau, the whole team went to Taiwan for centralized training for two weeks. Of course, for the women's team, uh, we are the defending champion. Uh, but uh, I told the team, don't give yourself unnecessary pressure. Uh, we also know that to beat China the second time is near impossible. The team from China is already in Dortmund to get ready for the competition, which starts on the 25th of March. And Team Singapore may find it difficult to retain their title as Republic's leading women player, Feng Tianwei, has seen a dip in form. It's going to be a busy year for the team as after the World Championships is the 2012 Olympics. A target of two medals has been set. That's why the paddlers will be in London a month ahead of the Games for intensive preparations. Finally, Singapore's best cheerleading teams are preparing to bring it on for this weekend's national championships. Something that they would really break out the pom-poms for if their passion gets National Sports Association status from the Singapore Sports Council. Cheerleaders say it would really jumpstart interest in the activity and that their routines are as grueling as any other physical sport. And you can see why. This has been News 5 tonight. Good night.